Yeah, I'm Mike yeah. Miles from Birmingham, and I'm the treasurer of Jefferson County, which is Birmingham and 36 other municipalities, most of which owe me money today, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and my name is Jocelyn Broman. I'm a With People alumni, competed back in 2006. I currently work on Capitol Hill for Representative Paul Cook of California. All right, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, please. I'm Kelsey Prather. I'm a junior from Clay County High School, representing West Virginia. I'm Julia Holcomb. I'm also a junior from Clay County High School. Uh, I'm Tyler Cummings. Uh, I'm also a junior from Clay County High School, and this is our teacher, Mr. Phil Dobbins. Hello. Welcome. Thank you so much for being with us here today. All right, so I will go ahead and read the question, and once I'm done, you can begin your statement. All right. All right. So, Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution provides that state legislatures can determine the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives, yet give Congress the power to make or alter such regulations. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the uniform election process? What responsibility do state legislatures, state election officials, and citizens have in maintaining free and fair elections? What are the advantages and disadvantages of the trustee and delegate theories of representation as they apply to congressional districts? You may begin. In the Constitution, the framers gave states the freedom to set their election dates when they chose to do so. The election process generally starts in March with the primary elections where nominees can campaign and gain support to be elected a Democratic or Republican candidate for presidency. Then in November, the general election is held for the President of the United States. Thanks to elections being around the same time for all the states, it allows the nominees to visit places across the nation and campaign. Also, when the election is closer, people tend to focus on the nation uh, or more on politics and media at that time. Ballots are also mass produced and polls are more likely to be conducted while people are focused on government and elections. Some disadvantages of a uniform elections process is that it may work better in cities than in more rural areas in the U.S. Also, voter ID laws put some people at a disadvantage when it comes to voting. This vote, these voter laws uh, require people to have identification and pay for the documents that are paired along with the ID. According to an ACLU poll, only 11% of U.S. citizens or more than 21 million Americans do not have government-issued photo identification. To understand each responsibility, we must first acknowledge the structures of state and local election systems with their relevance to Congress and our national government. If these said systems and states weren't constitutional or not fair for the citizens, then Congress can incentivize change. An example of such is the Help America Vote Act of 2002, which requires states to establish a uniform standard of what counts as a vote for in their specific voting systems. But that being said, we get into the responsibility of state legislatures that pass state law and state constitutions. This duty is controlled by them and citizens would elect these legislatures with the hope in mind that they would make the voting process as fair and free as possible. They regulate elections at state level and local level with various election officials at a state level being elected. With this power, state legislatures can pass amendments with the input of the governor and could possibly regulate how election officials are chosen and or elected. Each of these systems can vary state to state, but elected officials who run federal elections within state and local counties, such as the county clerk, have the responsibility to preside over the elections and make sure that the process is as smooth and fair as possible. This offers citizens a much easier path to vote. Voters themselves have a responsibility of electing said officials on the state and local level, and even have incentives, incentives in some states that allow them to propose their own constitutional amendments that can repeal or affirm election administration laws that are adopted by their state legislatures. When speaking of a representative democracy like the one in the United States, it is essential for the citizens to participate in their government. This means allocating time to vote for the best representative possible, in some eyes, such as one of the main promoters of the trustee theory, Edmund Burke, it is someone who is of an unbiased opinion, mature judgment, and enlightened conscience. Within this theory, constituents elect their representatives as trustees for their constituency. The trustees have a sufficient autonomy to deliberate and act in favor of the greater common good. This way easily deals with tyranny of the majority since it is a form of representative democracy. It also allows for better judgment within the congressional district because this representative has more access to resources. However, the disadvantage of the system is that it gives less of a voice to the minority since the representative would need to act in accordance with the majority to get elected for office. 
The opposite representation of this system is the delegate theory of representation. This is when the constituents elect their representatives to act as the voice of the people and the representative exercises no autonomy. This system gives more voice to the people and allows there to be a deeper reflection of their will in the congressional district. However, this system does not allow for the representative to differ their opinion, say, if they receive classified information in the event of a tie or if the majority's thoughts are not for the greater good. We're now ready for your questions. Excellent. All right. Um, since we're talking about voting here, do you think there are any groups that are still disenfranchised in our voting system? And if so, who and what's causing the disenfranchisement? The first um, thing that pops into my head when I think of disenfranchised voting, I think of political gerrymandering. And in a certain case that pops into my head is Rucho versus Common Cause in 2019, which is where the courts actually deemed political gerrymandering a political question. So this is still an unresolved argument that's still continuing. And I believe that political gerrymandering is unfair to the minor minority party in the state of what legislature is in power like what party is in power in the legislature so for north carolina for example the democrat the republican party actually drew the district lines to where less uh, it was gerrymandering against the democratic party um and uh to to react to that, some could argue that since the existence of, major of uh, majority minority districts, where uh, there's predominantly uh, more, say, African American people in that district, and what state legislatures do, oftentimes, uh, whoever has the most control of that state legislature, whatever that party may be, they often do this method called crack and pack, where they would break apart uh, districts or and make them uh, less important to the voting process, or possibly. Um, Split, uh, making a tiny uh, Democratic district, say, and put it in a Republican district to where their votes are essentially uh, nullified. And although uh, partisan gerrymandering has been uh, ruled as a, um, a political question, uh, racial gerrymandering is uh, ruled as an absolute no in uh, congressional districts with the cases Miller v. Johnson in 1995 and Shaw v. Reno in 1993. And also, uh, there's some instances of where state legislatures or some states actually uh, have an independent voting uh, or independent commission to actually draw their district lines, such as the Supreme Court case, uh, Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Voting Commission, where the Supreme Court deemed it constitutional and uh, legal for uh, Arizona to do that and to have uh, unbiased um, uh, people do their uh, lines for them. I also feel that the independent party or a third party essentially uh, is disenfranchised when voting because due to Duvenger's law, we tend to go more towards the party that would get more votes. So essentially, if you have two, if you have somebody on the extreme right, and then you have somebody in moderate right, and then you have somebody in moderate left, the extreme right would go into the moderate right to get more votes for that party or that certain person that is running in that area. And uh, it's also seen in the 1992 election uh, where H. Ross Perot actually dropped out of the race but then re-entered and some would say that since his third since he was the third party it often took away George H.W.'s votes and then that is an instance of where a third party actually um, interfered or I wouldn't say interfered but actually uh, changed the way a typical election would go. You all mentioned uh, uh, in your statement about state legislatures and then also state election officials responsibilities. Which do you think is ultimately more important, the state legislature creating the state election law or the state election officials implementing and administering the law? Personally, I feel that the state election officials ha that have the ability to create these laws have the responsibility to further um, fair laws. So for example, in West Virginia, there is a automatic voter registration law in order to make the voting registration process easier. So when you go to a DMV, you can select your political party if you're 18 or older due to the 26th amendment that lowered the voting age to 18. And, but you also have the right to not 
register. So you can select that you don't have to register. But it just, it's supposed to make the process more easier and allow greater access to the people, which I think is a great thing to do. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree with my colleague more. Uh, uh, as it comes to state election officials, their job is to make it as smooth and easy as possible. Even going to the county clerk and registering uh, to vote and uh, having them help you out. It's just getting across to more uh, people and possibly with it being such a locality and having it so close to us, uh, students like us who uh, can register to vote and vote even in this election, uh, it would be nice to have it easily done and to where uh, it's nice to register and be uh, civically engaged. Well, on that subject, you uh, this wasn't what I was going to ask, but you got me hooked out now. Um, they can make it technologically very easy to vote now. They have the technology where you can vote on your phone or you can vote on your app if you want to. But that's going to get a lot of people that have phones. If, is voting on a cell phone, is voting on an app where anybody that wants to can, is that a good idea? Personally, I feel well, like that there is a lot of um, possibility for it to be interfered with due to how technolog technologically advanced people are to where hacking can be accessed. But in the Constitution, it specifically states that when the presidential election can take place. So the only way to be able to interfere with this presidential election would be to would be the states to perform a different type of voting. And generally the federal government uh, is more to push voting rights and states are more to limit voting rights, say as for felons or online voting, et cetera. Okay. That's time guys. Nice Great. job. Thank All right. Thank you so much for um, your statement and for your response to the follow-up questions. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed, and we haven't really heard this from other groups, so I was really glad to talk about it, was um, the idea of gerrymandering and political gerrymandering, and you brought up racial gerrymandering. And uh, with your discussions of the gerrymandering, I thought you did a really good job of um, connecting it to Supreme Court cases with your constitutional application there. Um, and, uh, you know, you brought up the idea of independence uh, being disenfranchised franchise, which is another thing um, we haven't really heard about so much. Um, so um, you brought up so a lot of uh, interesting things, things that we haven't um, really heard before. So it was a nice, refreshing conversation of some new topics. So I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I will echo that. I um, love that discussion. Hearing, um, talking about the political gerrymandering um, and then racial gerrymandering and then talking about what the solution is, which is this in what one solution could be with the independent commissions and bring up the Arizona case. That was a great discussion of all of that. Um, and with my question of asking which, which is more important, state legislatures versus state officials, um, it is true, absolutely, that state officials have this responsibility to keep everything running fair, but you do have to wonder what happens if the underlying law is not fair? How then is the state official going to be able to implement something that may not be fair. So there is that balance in regards to, is it better, is it more important to create the law or more important to administer? And you guys did a great job of defending your point of like you need to have uh, officials responsibility to have a smooth and easy election. And that local aspect is also very important that we haven't heard from other classes yet today. But always dig a little deeper of whether it's gonna be, um, important to create versus the importance of like interpreting and actually putting into practice. So you guys did a great job of all of your discussion and I loved your statement as well. Um, mentioned Burke in regards for trustees and I'm always uh, as a fan of Edmund Burke I'm always glad to hear his name as well. So thank you so much for a great presentation. Yeah I just kept making the list. I agree. Francine I thought this was the best mix of theory versus practical application maybe that we've heard today uh, the particular attention paid to the local officials and the root the, the power that they have in this the secretary of state can affect who's on the list who's on the voter roll but the local officials have an awful lot of impact on who actually gets to get there and who doesn't 
the mention of the third parties as far as who's disenfranchised, uh, they're disenfranchised. They still are. Uh, Dustin and I'm with you when, when he said Edmund Burke, my head snapped up when they said that. And I appreciated the common cause reference. Francine is our court case expert when they used <laughs> common cause ideas. Philip, I want to say this last thing, and that is that I think to get degree of difficulty points for having this many juniors on one one unit. When I was a junior in high school, I was frantically trying to remember where my locker was. And these people are sitting here talking <laughs> constitutional law with us at this early hour of the morning. This was, I think you can tell they hooked us out and got us going. And we were scribbling one note after another after another, which is a compliment to them and certainly a compliment to you. Thank you for bringing this team to us this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you.